welcome everyone. I'm very excited about this reimagine global conversations um, uh, today. You know, we're talking about a project that both of you are co-founders of, uh, the hashtag uh, Ubuntu Love Challenge project, which uh, both of you are co-founders of. And I'm very excited to talk to you, not just about that, of course, but about, um, about what led you to where you are and also about where you imagine. The series is called Reimagine the Future, how it can be different. What have we learned from the current um, COVID crisis? And you have to forgive me, but because I know you're both avid fans of poetry and poets yourselves, mm -hmm. I wanted to start just to set the mood by reading you a poem that I've read when we first opened, you know, Moments of Transition. It's a poem translated uh, from Hafez, uh, the, the Persian poem, poet, and uh, it's translated by Daniel Ladinsky. And um, it's called To Build a Swing. And I'll just read it if you don't mind. You carry all the ingredients to turn your lives into a nightmare. Don't mix them. You have all the genius to build a swing in your backyard for God. That sounds like a hell of a lot more fun. Let's start laughing, drawing blueprints, gathering our talented friends. I will help you with my divine lyre and drum. Hafiz will sing a thousand words you can take into your hands like golden saws and silver hammers, polished teak, strong silk rope. You carry all the ingredients to turn your life into joy. Mix them. <laughs> so I love that poem. <laughs> and forgive me for indulging in that way, but um, you know, I, 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 in the work, uh, when I did a bit of research about what, what you've both done, I saw that, that ethos of gathering people, of convening people, um, and that being a very strong aspect of both your leadership. So perhaps um, Sheikh Abudur um, Al-Qasimi, we could start with, um, with you, if you could tell us a little bit. And then, of course, Mamadou um, Tuere, if you, if you can join in as you feel, we'll try and have a conversation. Uh, and keep it um, keep it going. Ulrika and I will pop in if we think we need to. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Amirali. Thank you, Ulrika, for this really kind invitation. We're so excited to be here and having this conversation with you. And uh, reimagined. I mean, that word in itself just opens so many doors and possibilities. So what a theme! Uh, and. Um, before I start, I also want to share a poem with you. I'm sure Mamadou is also trying to get his poem out, <laughs> but, um, but I also want to share a poem that I think would explain what we are actually trying to do here. Obviously, Mamadou and I, you know, we met at Davos. We were both young global leaders at the World Economic Forum, and we both have a strong affinity to making this world a better place. We both feel um, a lot of uh, challenges, the injustice that's happening in the world. We feel this responsibility to give back. Um, and so there was a lot that, that kind of brought us together. And uh, once we uh, discussed how we can improve the state of the world today, the Ubuntu Love Challenge was born. Uh, so I actually want to read a poem of Hafez as well that I believe kind of reflects a little bit of what you're saying, um, Amir Ali. So the poem I, I want to choose is called Bani Adam, or Humankind. And it reads, the children of Adam are members of each other and are from the same essence in their creation. When the conditions of time hurt one of these members, other members will suffer from discomfort. If you are indifferent to the misery of others, it is not fitting that they should call you a human being. And that, in a nutshell, really explains why we're, you know, launching this challenge, this Ubuntu Love Challenge. We feel that the word Ubuntu in itself has so much meaning. I am because we are. 
um, if I am unhappy or if I am sad or if I am ill, then you know my community also suffers. And so we each need to take that responsibility for our communities and 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 rise to the challenge and try to improve. Uh, the conditions of our society in any way possible. This is so beautiful and it sets the scene really uh, so well for telling us a little bit more about the Ubuntu Love Challenge and perhaps Mamadou, you could start really how was the idea born and where do you feel you want to take it with Sheikh Abudua? I think, uh, thank you very much, first of all, you know, for, for having us today, uh, and apologies again um, for, for, for being uh, a bit behind schedule. Uh, it's uh, a very important initiative for us that um, is somehow hard to explain, mm -hmm. right? I've tried to figure it out over, I mean, since I've been stranded here, but how did this happen, why it happened? The more I go, the more I realized that it was destiny. You know, um, the, when you have the, such a convergence of factors, events, um, and two individuals very, very committed to make this world a better place, um, that get uh, both really called to the core of their heart, um, by this current situation that affects them and the people around them and that face each other and look at the situation thinking we can't remain silent. We can't remain passive. Then the response to the we can't is that was, you know, uh, soaring within it, each of us was, therefore, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Right? And what to do was another very natural response was to make sure people awaken, make sure people realize that they're stronger than the events have them to believe, and make sure that they develop enough strength from within and recover the intrinsic power to deploy a collective decentralized response. So it was, um, it was me being stuck here as an event, first of all, right? It was um, the whole situation happening around on TV that she was being exposed to, and even locally, about her own people, you know, the people of Sharjah, the people of the, the Emirates, and, you know, uh, people in the acquaintances that she would know would be affected, but also the whole fear environment, right? So you have two ways to react to fear. You hide or you face it, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think it became very natural for us to decide to face it because at the end of the day, we've tried all our lives and for a very long time to one, uncover the truth. Remember, she's an archaeologist, right? Um, uh, to, to second, like um, Amarali was saying, to gather the truths, right? And both have been leading in our respective spheres and found ourselves at the, as young global leaders at the World Economic Forum. So when two young global leaders meet with this quest for truth and change, Therefore, something is going to happen. So the rest is history, as you know. <laughs> but could you give us a little bit more detail how you got started, the two of you? Because you met in Davos in Switzerland, and then you started the conversations, and obviously your passions mixed, and you were, yes. went home determined to do something. And of course, Sheikha is based in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates, and you are based in Cameroon, right? So how did the idea germinate into the first concrete um, uh, actions, let's say? Perhaps, Sheikha, you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so when we first met actually in Davos, we were, we were discussing other initiatives that I was working on and that Mamadou was also working on. 
And he said, then when I'm planning to visit the UAE and I'll reach out to you and we can, you know, continue our discussion. Um, he reached out to me uh, while he was in the UAE, but I was uh, busy. I couldn't see him. And then he ended up being stranded in the UAE uh, and reached out to me and said, guess what? I'm still here I'm, and I don't know when I'm going to leave. So we have time to meet. So we met up and um, actually we were talking more about COVID-19 and what's happening with, with people around us more than any other projects. And we both felt this, this need to, um, to respond to the fear that was com coming around. You know, we, we felt that people, um, that fear is contagious, you know, and that if you don't have this naturally high vibration of love and high vibration of we'll get through it. And we, we really feel that, that, um, whatever challenges come our way, we overcome it. Um, then it becomes, then fear can overtake you. Uh, and we were discussing this element actually. And then um, Mamadou mentioned the word Ubuntu. And I believe that word Ubuntu just kind of has this magical power in the actual word itself. I mean, when you say it properly and you, and I'll leave Mamadou to do that, uh, to say it in the proper <laughs> African way, it really resonates deep within your core and it activates every cell in your body. And it makes you feel like you need to do something. You know, Ubuntu means I am because we are, we're human beings, we have feelings, we need to react to those feelings. We need to be human again. You know, we've forgotten what it is, what it means to be a human being and to care and to be kind and compassionate. And so that was really the core of our discussion. And it led to us uh, saying, okay, let's, let's kind of try to talk a little bit more about Ubuntu. Let's have a challenge within our community. Let's get people involved and we'll call it the Ubuntu Love Challenge. And it grew organically to what it is today. So I don't know, Mama, do if you want to add anything to that. I mean, it's uh, you, yes, you've uh, the the facts and uh, the way you say it are, are more than uh, correct and inspiring. You feel like you want to leave the story again, you know. <laughs> but although it's uh, it's been quite a challenge indeed, and we decided to make it a challenge for everyone to rise to the challenge, right? So, um, what is what is uh, what should, when you say Ubuntu, right? Ubuntu, uh, uh, you know, back home indeed is is what we would say, you know, in some part of Southern Africa, in a case where there is either dispute or problem or crisis. As a reminder, you don't say much; you say Ubuntu, right? And in, and indeed, once people hear that word, is the kind of like you know when you hit the gong or the the the, the bell for people to say, hey, remember, we're humans, right? And I think in these times, as, as she mentioned, uh, uh, it was very important to kind of go and take back what, the, what is the very essence of our shared humanity. And uh, Ubuntu represented that word. And if you take the case of Africa, you know, uh, and which is what I was telling her, is that the world needs resilience today, right? And they might not have been prepared to that. And the reason why we, we've been calling upon Ubuntu a lot on the continent is also because we've gone through a lot, right? Um, as Africans, you know, of course, with the case of uh, slavery, colonization, etc. And what has made us resilient is was this faith in humanity, this hope that actually there is good in all of us, right? And that this too shall pass, right? And that ultimately humanity will prevail. Right, and that's when I shared also the stories with her that choosing that word as a challenge became a natural choice. And uh, of course, it's a word that have that have guided me along my path and along the years that um, uh, has helped me through also as an individual to go through things. And as I was going through this, being stranded here in the UAE, um, that's also the words that came to me. Right, Ubuntu right? It's okay, right? So it's not you akuna matata, uh, typical kind of a word. It's something that says the strength is within you and we are with you and we are all humans and we should go beyond this. That's There's so, so much resonance in what you're saying, both of you, and um, 
the um, Aga Khan development networks ethos and ethic, the ethic of pluralism, this idea of hope that the work that we, we do is about empowering people to recognize and remember that they have hope. But there's also this idea of civil society, which is so strong in both of the independent work that both of you do, like, because Ubuntu itself is an older movement um, uh, than the Ubuntu Love Challenge. You, you, you founded that, uh, Mamadou, uh, previously as well. So I'm thinking about how both of you have sought to empower people and this idea of civil society and doing things um, for ourselves. I think that that is a really powerful message. But also this idea, and I'm just hoping that um, uh, Sheikha Boudour could tell us about, about this, but the, the festival you just recently had um, uh, around the Ubuntu Love Challenge. And then I've, I've heard plans of working with artists uh, because that's close to our heart at the museum, uh, working with, um, uh, with artists. So, you know, I know I asked probably three questions there, but I thought, um, you know, maybe we could start uh, Sheikha Boudour if you had anything um, you wanted to say about um, those things. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, we, we just had the festival uh, on Saturday, um, on Saturday, the 21st of June. Uh, and we actually picked that day because of all of the things that were happening around the world. We had a summer solstice, we had a, a solar eclipse and a new moon. And we thought it's a really auspicious day to hold the festival. Um, we brought in spiritual leaders from all over the world and we did a global meditation and we had an opening ceremony that was done by Queen Diambi of the DRC and she did a, a, a water ceremony called Healing Waters. And that was just a beautiful way to start the whole um, festival. And we ended it with um, a shaman from Mexico we also had strategic partners with us, La Ciel Foundation, Davos Block Base, uh, Black Canvas in the UAE, and the Wisdom Center uh, in the Philippines. And so we work closely with all our partners to bring the best, really, and curate a, a day full of inspiration as well as healing. And our theme was healing humanity from social and racial injustice. We felt that that was a powerful theme uh, considering what was happening in the world today. We felt that we have to go through this healing process um, so that we could actually rise to the challenges and, and move ahead and that we all carry within us a lot of wounds and pain from our ancestors that we need to heal and let go of. And that was evident with the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, we felt that strongly, whether you were black or not, you, it resonated with all of us, you know, it was a very important uh, movement. And that unless we, we did that healing, unless we did that work, it was very difficult for us to transcend and move on and, and into a peaceful future. So that's a little bit about the festival. And I mentioned uh, earlier that we're planning to have a second one on July 5th, um, coinciding with the lunar eclipse as well, but um, continuing with the theme of spirituality. But later in the year, we're planning something a little bit more fun and lighthearted with musicians and artists, which we will share more details in the future. Healing through creativity, that is such an important point. And um, I would love to know from both of you, because you actually as individuals both come from creative families, families of historians, poets, musicians, writers, artists. And um, what do you see, the, or how do you see the role of the arts in the broadest um, definition of the term in making the world a better place. And I would like to start with Mamadou because Mamadou is, uh, comes from a musical family and is a passionate poet himself. So how do you see the power of the arts in contributing to a better world? Well, thank you for, for this very important question. Um, I'll start by, by reading um, a, a quick quote uh, a, few, a, a bit of a text from um, uh, Eckhart Tolle, and then I'll share my personal story when it comes to art and music. 
The beginning of freedom is the realization that you are not the thinker. The moment you start watching the thinker, a higher level of consciousness becomes activated. You then begin to realize that there is a vast realm of intelligence beyond thought. That thought is only a tiny aspect of intelligence. You also realize that all the things that truly matter, beauty, love, creativity, joy, inner peace, arise from beyond the mind. You begin to awaken. So it says it all. Thought, think, or act in a limited space. Creativity has no limit. What is more powerful? Creation, right? And we come from creation. And yet, we still at 40% of our capacities as created beings. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to my personal experience about music and about creativity, so from the, my dad indeed is a musician, right? He arrived in France, uh, you know, his parents didn't want him to do music. They wanted him to be, you know, a typical engineer or something like that, but he was passionate about music. So he left the house and went to Europe to try his luck, right? Um, got us to come a bit later, etc. What was very interesting is that from the age of nine, I was going with him in studio and I was doing my homework in recording studio. At that very moment, I understood one thing as I was holding the pen to do math. There was something much more powerful than the math I was doing. It was the music behind the frequency. And the coding, depending on the frequency that was triggered, my state of mind shifted. And then I understood how powerful it is by creating something and put it on a wavelength for somebody else to receive. Could be music, could be art, visual, right? Or painting that triggers something in you that you can't explain, mm -hmm. that science cannot explain yet. So it's more advanced. So this for me, art has been part of who I am and what I breathe really. And also my roots as an African, music is the ancestral base, not only for communication, for communion, for celebration, but also for transcending our humanity. That's what we've been taught by our ancestors. And there was no ancient wisdom without sound and music. And music heals. When you're sad, you put a song. It, helps, it either helps you take, it, take the sadness away, or it energizes you to forget about it. And that is powerful. And at a time where we've been relying so much on rationalism and that it's coming to its, you know, showing its limits, right? That's where we realize that maybe we need to look somewhere else. And um, if you look also, the power of art, um, it unites people. Is that one very thing, right? Take the case of Black Lives Matter that opposed white black cops. They would listen to the blues. They would listen to jazz, right? No matter who they are, no matter their background, it unites. And there is this story that is very powerful uh, that really touched my heart that um, a friend of mine told me about Bob Marley, right? So. Uh, you know, at the time in um, Kingston, Jamaica, you had like those two big factions politically very opposed and a lot of tensions. The country was really at the border of civil war, right? And then uh, Bob Marley decided to do this concert, right? Um, and, um, and he decided to invite the both leaders of the opposing side to sit at the front row of the concert. And people told him, Bob, you're crazy. We're going to shoot you. This thing is going to burn into fire. What are you doing, right? And you know, you, and they said, you're going to die. You, you, you don't realize what's going on. Bob said, you know, if I'm going to die, I might as well die spreading love. <laughs> and he played that song that people hadn't heard yet at the time that he wrote. 
And the song was One Love, One Heart. Let's get together and be all right. Hey, the children crying. One love, one heart. At the moment he played that, peace came. He took both opponents, raised both their hands, and got them to shake hands. That's the power of music, right? And, um, and you have it from primitive on arts, on the walls. The messages that they were passing were extremely powerful. And the symbols. What they were painting were our past and our future at the same time in caves. This was art already. So I think we've underestimated it. And you now have sound healing. Everybody knows about that, right? Uh, whenever you do an ultrasound, etc., it's a frequency. Light is a frequency. Everything is frequency. The magicians are the ones that can transcend frequency to impact your physical body beyond your etheric body, right? And that's what is coming back to the fore. And that's why this festival is so important for Sheikh Hainai, is to remind people that there's so much more power that we don't know of and that we've been ignoring for too long that needs to come back to the front. And it's a beautiful power that anybody can get with or without going to school. It's a divine power, the power to create. Yeah. That's what the festival is about, and inspire and spread the love for oneness. It's actually so true because Amir and I, we were talking about it recently, and when you think about the um, output of ordinary people in terms of art in the broadest sense at the moment all over the world, it shows you that it's actually not at all an indulgence on the fringes. It is an existential human instinct to externalize, yes. you know, what's inside you and to find a way of communicating that to, to your fellow human beings exactly as, as you are saying. So, uh, Sheikha, you also come from a very cultured and artistic family, and your professional passion is poetry and literature. Is there anything else in terms of art that really, really drives you as an individual as well as a professional? Well, I, I agree with everything Mamadou is saying, you know, self-expression right now is what we need in this world. And, um, you know, as a publisher, I feel really privileged to be able to bring that to the forefront, you know, to because I believe that stories have the power, the power to heal, the power to connect people, the power to inspire people. And so, um, you know, being a publisher really puts me at the core of this, you know, this mission. And, um, and also there are a lot of, how do I say this, unsung heroes, you know, around the world who are doing wonderful things. So I feel very privileged to be able to bring their voice to the forefront and really show what they're doing. So for me, literature, poetry are all important forms of, of self-expression, art and music as well. Um, you know, I, I paint and play a little bit of music, but I will not sing for you today like Mama do has. Uh, I can't sing, <laughs> <though>. <laughs> um, But, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Ulrika, they're all very important forms of self-expression. And we really believe that the festival here is a time for people to remember their innate powers, you know, their creativity, their light. Uh, you don't have to be, as Mamadou said, you don't have to be a professional or a PhD uh, holder or somebody in, you know, or with a high degree. Anybody has that light in them, that, that creativity. And if we can spark that, if we can inspire people, uh, then, you know, we believe that, that our job is done. We will continue to inspire people. We will continue to, to spread love uh, through our, our messages and our mission. But we also want people to remember that it's already in them. Oh, we can't hear you, Amirali. You're on mute. You're on mute. 
I, you know, I just wanted to say that I found uh, listening to both of you extremely inspiring and, you know, supportive of, of um, the work that we're trying to, to do through our programming also at our museum, because I think we're sharing, you know, so many values, recognizing the inherent creativity of people is so much a big part of that. And, you know, as we're poised just about to reopen and things are relaxing and we're slowly coming out into the world and meeting one another again, um, we have this opportunity to, um, to reimagine how we do that. How do we meet with one another again? How do, we, how do we speak to one another and have conversations going forward? And I'm, I, I thought you know, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd close off our lovely conversation today with hearing from both of you about, about your, how you imagine the future. What is your, um, what would you like to see um, in your ideal future going forward uh, as, this, as, as we come through this moment of fear? Uh, we can, uh, Shekha? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I told you how much I love the theme Reimagine because I am always looking for an opportunity to reinvent myself, you know? So for me, it's always great to have these periods of self-isolation because when you come out, you can actually reinvent yourself the way you believe you should be. I have definitely spent my uh, self-isolation really talking to myself about that, you know, what it is that I, that I want to continue with and what it is that I want to let go of. And it's really a beautiful time to, uh, to have that introspection, to spend time in solitude. For me personally, I spent a lot of time in nature and I really loved that. And I, I, I connected, you know, connected with nature, connected with my surroundings, whether it's in the desert or in the mountains or, you know, whatever um, possibility I could find here in the sea, for example, I really connected with nature and moving forward, you know, I'm thinking more about how I can look after Mother Earth a lot more, how I can be kinder to the environment, what I can do. I've made changes in, in what I'm eating and how I'm consuming things and in, you know, little things like I've stopped buying plastic, for example, you know, I've made little changes in my life and I look back and I think I wouldn't have done that had I not been forced to stop and think about my personal impact on, on Earth, you know. Um, so for me, that's one example of the changes that, I, that I've taken during the self-isolation and how I want to be a better citizen in this world, really look after the environment, play my own role in, in uh, protecting Mother Earth but also in spreading more compassion and love. I miss hugging people. So now I'm just going to go and start hugging people as soon as it's safe to do that uh, and really cherish those relationships that we've, we've missed because we've been isolated from a lot of people. Thank you, Shekha. And Mamadou, would you like to have the last word? Sure. Um, I would like to, uh, you know, she said a lot um, uh, of, of, of very important things about uh, this uh, future that we see. Um, I would, my point that I might want to add is I see a future where we are one tribe, one human tribe, right? Um, because of my background, I've experienced the illusion of division and difference and separation that has caused so much trouble around the world. Once people get to that understanding that we are one, then that future will take place at light speed. And I've also, you know, to quote Rumi, you know, I was smart. I wanted to change the world. And then I got wise. I decided to change myself. And in this journey that I've gone through personally to change myself, um, I'm hoping that people get awakened as we do all those things and they do also and we all work together for this awakening about changing from within as so without becomes beautiful, right? And um, that's what I call the tribe of one. 
And um, there is um, this legend that says, back then, there used to be a golden age on the planet, right? Um, and the golden age was basically maintained um, by a collective spread across the planet that was called the tribe of one. And uh, there were at the same time oracles and warriors. And tribe one never lost a war and peace was maintained and universal knowledge was accessible to all because people were unlikely. But one day something happened. And one would call it a portal, other would call it a cataclysm or a catastrophe. But that lowered the vibration of the planet and led space for a lot of negativity and ego-driven wars and problems. And for the first time, Tribe One lost that the war. And as they fled, right, east, left, south. Something said, as the, many of them disappeared and that the, when the planetary grid become, became imbalanced, that one day the descendants or the reincarnations of Tribe One will gather again on the planet and build the new golden age, the new earth. And as I'm talking about that, it makes me think about a poem that I wrote seven years ago in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, um, at the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the African Union. And as you know, Africa is the cradle of mankind, where it all began. So I wrote this. If you allow me, I'll share. Yes, please. A few words of the poem. Anthem to the tribe of one. Yes, I am black. And I am somehow white. Through my mother's grace, I embrace Christianity. Honoring my father's gift, I am also Muslim. Owing the founding fathers my freedom and dignity. I grew up in music through mornings, celebrations. The rhythm of my pace flows from the hills of Makosa, hip hop, quieto, house music, to the shores of Kizumba. This is my story through greatness and commotions. I was taught philosophy, listening to my teachers, an ancestral wisdom, sitting with the elders. Here I stand today, yet again, tall and proud, strengthened with this belief I can see through the clouds. Often do I laugh or leave my soul to cry. Under this relentless smile runs the joy to feel alive. Under those hidden tears flows the resilient pain of my brothers, my sisters, that shall not be in vain. Under my thick, dark skin runs the blood of my ancestors, who once kings or slaves fought without an armor. I am here today witnessing our progress. I come here in peace to reminisce who were kings. Countless were the mistakes who shall not fall in despair driven by evergreen hope that the promised land is near. You don't understand me? Fine, but please don't judge me. You will not follow me? Fine, but please don't block me. 
Should I leave Earth today? Millions will replace me. It is the march of history. No human can reverse. I am that promised land where soon the world aspires to leave. I am that motherland to where all human memories lead. I am, you are, we are, Africa. Anthem to the tribe of one. Wow. So, thank, thank you. you for giving me that opportunity to share this uh, poem. And um, I think we need to reimagine a future where ancient wisdom is guiding us because we came here with the universal knowledge and we've forgotten it along the way. Yes. That's my answer. Well, I want to thank you both. Uh, that's a beautiful, the tribe of one. Uh, as, a, as a note to, to, to end on. And um, uh, Sheikha and Mamadou, thank you so much. I have loved uh, that this has been a poetry filled um, uh, conversation. I think it's very apt. Um, and uh, uh, again, thanks for your time um, and for, for giving from your busy schedules for this. Ulrika, was there anything you wanted to, to say to, to wrap up? All I can say is it was a privilege and um, count me in as far as your tribe one is concerned. And as far as hugs are concerned, I can't wait to give you both the warmest, most heartfelt hug ever when we finally meet face to face. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Thank, Thank you, you so much.